Well, greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well, and welcome back to tonight's second half. Before we jump into this very tragic and terrifying event, a couple links. As many of you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, and channel membership is in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadalny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support the channel to continue to grow and go, Simply subscribe, it does not cost you a cent. Click the like button, takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon and folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because all of these things really do help the channel to continue to grow and go. And yes, folks, they definitely do matter. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump in. To tonight's second half shall we all right guys so i have had my share of experiences on this channel that i have heard um and spoken with people about their experiences that kind of really have affected me jesse being one uh ron and his dad being another um just multiple i mean there's the, the poor woman in Bumpus Mills. Uh, but this one really kind of took the cake for me. I don't know why. Um, during the process of this woman sharing this experience with me, first of all, I'm taught, I was talking to someone that was my mom's age and, um, to hear the pain in her voice uh, actually did bring a tear to my eye. I don't know why. Jesse's did too, but this one really just hit me hard for some reason. Um, and I don't even know and didn't know her or her husband, you know. Uh, there's, a, there's a little county in Kentucky. It's no bigger than 20,000 people, the whole entire county. It's called Clay County. And there has been a multiple number of disappearances, uh, strange and unexplained um, deaths. And she, her name is Georgia, and she truly believes that... Uh, some of these deaths that are claimed to be murders are definitely not because she saw how the um, law enforcement in that area works firsthand. Um, first and foremost, this this poor woman, uh, her last name or her name is Georgia Baker. She is or her husband was. His name was Reginald Baker. And apparently, back in the day, in the Appalachia region, there were family blood feuds where it got real, uh, real violent. And her husband's side of the family was, was part of this famous Baker Howard um, clan feud. I've never heard of it, you know, it, but down there, apparently it's, it's, a uh, it's news. Um, so Georgia and her husband, Reginald had been married for quite some time. Um, about 15, 20 years. And, uh, they ended up finally buying some property and 
1987, um, they bought this little track of land just outside of uh, this region called Brightside, Kentucky. Once again, it's not, we're talking population, maybe 1,500 total. Um, and there's a, a creek that runs through this area. There's many creeks that run through the area. But the creek that her and her husband um, bought property around and on is called Powder Horn and uh, Powder Horn Branch. And there's an old kind of dirt road out there. And, you know, this is the way of life out there. You buy some property and you, you know, you and your family or your family builds a road for you and you build your home and you live there, you live your life there. So her husband um, grew up in this kind of feuding clan war and uh he he grew up in the backwoods um there's still some very remote locations in the south today that um almost seem unbelievable for us but for or you know us, I guess, you know, because I've never seen anything like what she explained to me where her husband was raised and grew up in. Um, so she met her husband very young and they, they fell in love. Uh, her husband did odds and ends. He was a good, good man. Um. But, you know, the poor area that they lived in, they scraped and scraped by and they eventually saved enough money to buy some land uh, for real cheap in 1987. And they put up a house. It took them about a year for them to build this house. They were living at his family's home while they did their, you know, built their home. Uh, a way of life is your family works with you and, you know. So she had heard throughout the years of knowing Reginald um, that there, during these these kind of clan wars, these, this Howard Baker clan war, uh, that there were times that some of these family members would run into, um, dog man. And there was a, there was a different name for them. Uh, she doesn't exactly remember the right name that they were called. I brought up Catamount, but she said, you know, that that's more or less what they said about Dogman and Bigfoot and anything un kind of undescribable, any kind of strange noise or strange sighting out there. That's the old Catamount. Um, so Georgia remembers hearing all of this, um, family members uh, being attacked, other family members being attacked. Apparently, at one point, this family blood feud had been put on hold in the 50s um, for a bit until they could figure out what happened to a few of their family members. They'd actually uh, gotten together and spoke about it. You know, this Howard Baker families came together and said, you know, there were a few of our family and your kin and they were killed by something. What? what did it we need to find out what did this and the dog man was the culprit apparently so their first year in their home um was was good 
you know, it's a, you're in the, you're in the deep, deep Appalachia region. There's your nearest neighbor is at that point in 87 is miles away. Um, she said that the, um, bright shade is now, you know, a, a populace compared to what it was in 87. <clears throat> they, um, they had their first child, uh, soon after moving into their new home and, um, things were going as planned, you know, they just live life and, you know, you, you, there's not much opportunity, unfortunately. So it's just live your life and be happy. Um, hunt, fish, family, God, this and that. Apparently, one evening, uh, Reginald was coming home down this dirt road. He had an old pickup truck that he used to um, kind of collect scrap and stuff. And on his day of, you know, days of picking, he'd, you know, come back home and, you know, then they'd drive out a couple hours or whatever to turn this scrap and metal in um you know he he did some logging periodically he did whatever he could to make ends meet well he was coming home he had a full full truckload of metal and uh just scrap um at the time their home was all the way to the end of this little road called powder horn and um no other houses were on it and he was almost to their house and at this point there was no this is interesting because at this point in 87 their home did not have electricity at that point yet um they had to wait until almost 1990 before power was put in. And um, so he was driving in and he had seen this just monstrous canine human running down the road towards his house. It wasn't running through the woods. It wasn't, it was standing in the middle of the road as he was coming down and it was staring straight at him in his truck. And as he was getting closer to it, it turned around and just started running down the road towards his home. No other homes on this road. And he gave it some gas. And as the, he got through his home, this thing just shot into the woods. Well... He gets out of his truck and runs inside and checks on his family and everything's okay. This, this, and that. And through the next couple of years, things were smooth. Uh, they had a couple of different kind of sightings with this dog man or dog, you know, many dog men. Um, Periodically, they would jump on the roof and to make themselves known. Um, they had lost some chicken. They had some chickens. Uh, but for the most part, <clears throat> for the first couple of years, it was just here and there, you know. And uh, power got finally put in. And apparently another house was going to be built kind of a ways away from them. They had the, they had the furthest end property. And 
so another home was going to be built on the kind of like entrance of uh, powder horn and that road is right off of this road called mill creek road and that's what they had to kind of wait for for electricity you couldn't they're not going to put electricity down there for one house so you got to have one or two you know two maybe three but at two they they did run power out there and so they had their first you know um which is so weird because in 91 you know you don't think or 90 you don't think that some places in america didn't have power yet which is so weird um he then got his cdl and he started doing truck driving um their lives started getting a little better and uh he was making a little bit more money and georgia has now got three kids um the first one and then a set of twins were born in 89 uh so you know she's taking care of their kids um they got a little garden and they've got chickens um you know so they're kind of self-sufficient but he's got a decent job he's making you know decent money for that period of time and decent money for that area especially um no way rich but as she put it we were family rich and uh At the kind of last week of June in 1991, things, for some reason, started to progress um, for the family. There was another house being built in the middle between the house closest to Mill Creek and their home. And she thinks quite possibly that that may be one of the reasons why um local local family you know not outsiders no outsiders were moving in to this region for you know anything at that period of time and um you know now every once in a while people from out of state do move for just to be that much closer to nature and stuff but um so now at one point their whole chicken coop had been just ripped apart um everything you know they pretty much lost their whole source of meat and eggs at that point and uh reginald had a week off and he's gonna rebuild this chicken coop and you know figure out what did this you know they kind of had an idea of what of what did it but so he's now building this a better chicken coop one that is not indestructible obviously by any means but is gonna give whatever a run for its money and He's cutting lumber and doing a lot of their own uh, lumber. He apparently is that skilled that he could, you know, do. He didn't have to go to a lumber mill. He could do a lot of it on his own. And his family members would come and help, you know. And uh, so one night he's got it all set up and it's done he's gonna you know get some more chicken from family and you know other folks in the region that he can he can get them from whether it be trade or whatever 
because uh, even though they did have, you know, he did have a decent job, it was all about, you know, living, you know, um, bills, you know, she had a vehicle, uh, he bought her a vehicle, an old station wagon that she was driving around, and um, so the night that it's done, he's out you know, kind of looking at it and they got an old spotlight or not spotlight, but floodlight on the front porch that kind of was right there. He could shine it on this chicken coop and, and he's admiring his, you know, work and I can get some more chickens in there and I don't think anything's going to break in. And he hears this growl and he starts to look around and where his um tractor for tractor trailer where his tractor is parked his truck um he sees kind of some movement in the shadows of this floodlight and he kind of yells you know get that hell out of here you know he doesn't think it's one of these creatures because it's just starting to get dark and um he goes up to the porch and he comes back out of the house with his shotgun and you know kind of yells out again you know get the hell off my property yada yada and he starts walking towards his truck now where his truck is, her station wagon's parked, and then his um, pickup truck is parked. So the tractor trailer without the trailer is parking, is parked, and then her car, his truck, kind of side by side, three. Um, he starts walking out that way, and he hears the growling. And it's coming from by his pickup truck and he pumps his shotgun and yells, you know, get the hell out of here. Um, within a split second, he said that he saw the shadow and there were eyes by his tractor trailer truck just staring at him um, from what he told Georgia. The eyes were almost as tall as the hood of the tractor trailer. And that scared him to no end. He didn't want to shoot because he was, you know, I don't want to hit my truck. I don't want to hit her car. Um, but I don't want to see any more of this thing. So we ran inside and, you know, Georgia said that, that was one of the few times that he was real scared and he kind of yells get the kids put them you know, you know we're all going to sleep in in our room for for the night with the with our babies and and uh everyone will be safe you know in 94 his oldest child is what, four years old his twins are only two and um so they end up sleeping in their room and they do hear a lot of movement outside and some kind of movement on their roof of their house uh, from what she remembers he had stayed up the entire night and he didn't see anything after it was on the roof. A couple days go by and it's back to work for him. And she's got to go pick up the chickens and get some um, stuff at the grocery store, which is, you know, a ways away, um, somewhere in Manchester. Uh, which is a city 
in Clay County. Um, so she had dro driven out there, got got what she needed, um, put her put her groceries away, or a little bit of stuff, whatever they got, and then put the chickens in the this chicken coop, and kind of moved on with the night. Um, he was due to be home in a day or two and she'd hear kind of scratching on the outside wall, um, howling, grunting, and something on the roof. Well, that goes on for a day or two. And then Reginald's back for uh, two two days tops before he's got to go back out. She tells him everything that happened, and he's like, "Okay, you know." Um, she didn't want to look at the house outside of the house because she kind of stayed. She was scared by herself in this just, you know, kind of empty road three houses on this road and he walks around the house to where she said she heard, you know, kind of, uh, kicking or whatever. And there's claw marks all along the back side of their house. Just kind of like it was just messing with her and probably watching her cause it knew, you know, she's got kids. He's not there. So, he gets scared at this point. Um, they hadn't lost any chickens, but he's like, you know, you got to go, go to your family's, uh, take the kids and go, you know, I want to see what really is going on. I got a couple days off. So she leaves and he's by himself for two days. She doesn't know what happened in those two days. All she knows is in two days, she's driving down her road. It's now the first part of August of 91. And she's, it's getting dark, but not real. Really, it's about 6.30, but it's getting dark and darker than most at 6.30 in August because of the dense foliage of the, the trees all around them. So she's got her lights on and she's driving into her driveway, and which is the end of the road. And she sees this, from a distance, she sees this, uh, large kind of mass in the road and she honks her horn and because she can't figure out what it is if he had fallen or in her head she's thinking that her husband fell um you know what's what's going on and this thing kind of raises up and is now off of her husband. And she realizes what it is. It's one of these dog men. So at this point, she sees this thing get up and this kind of mass on the ground still. She puts her high beams on and what she sees is one of these dog men getting off of her husband who is, you know, lying on the ground. Um, she's still a distance away. And she very quickly did like a four point turn and was out of there. She was right back to her families. And she's telling her, you know, parents what happened um her older brother 
that lives down the road from her parents. You know, let's tell Reginald's family what happened. Let's, you know. And she's like, no, we need to call the police. We need to get someone down there now. But, you know, someone's got to come, you know, we got to go down kind of as a, as a team and leave the kids here with her mom. Um, because if he's there and he's hurt, we got to save him. So a few of Reginald's kin are contacted and Georgia and her brother get in the car and they drive out. They meet Reginald's family, a few of his cousins and a brother or something and they pull in and uh he is he is deceased um he's it looked like the dog man hadn't just killed him but was now um started to consume reginald So any kind of tender area on his body has been consumed. His innards, his inner organs are gone. He's got a big open kind of cavity. Um, his legs have just bites. His arms are, you know. It must have been one horrific death. And that's when she started getting teary, tearing up. And then I started to, you know feel her pain um what sent her over the edge was her husband's face had been um almost removed and his eyes were gone it was just a, a sight that she has never, ever forgotten. So they make the decision to keep two of his family members there. Let's get, we got a call. We got to contact the law enforcement. And they do. And law enforcement comes out. Um, apparently at that point in time, uh, there's no need for an ambulance or EMS and they call the county coroner and the county coroner comes and picks him up and, uh, the police department mark it as a, um, animal attack and they try to tell her you know coyote could do this um any kind of large cat in the area could do this but she knew what she saw when she pulled in and what did this for real so throughout the next you know couple of days um, she's not at their home and she's contacted that her home is uh, no longer livable. Now she hasn't even gotten to put her poor husband uh, in their family plot in her, you know, her husband's family plot, the Baker plot there. And now she's told that her home is apparently had caught on fire. So the next day she drives in and their house is just kind of like this skeletal structure of burnt wood and you know not much is is left. On top of now, she doesn't have a husband to help rebuild. Uh, 
the chicken coop is looks like it had been torn in through the back side uh, was also set on fire um, just her this whole kind of section just sat on fire and she's you know looking her brothers you know they're looking for any kind of mem you know memories old pictures whatever and the brother you know goes in of this skeletal structure and kind of feels around with his hand and realizes that you know parts of the structure are still warm there's you know this must have just happened the same night that she was informed about her house being unlivable and the brother screams something to her and she kind of runs runs out in the back of the house and into this kind of little yard they had where Reginald was going to build uh their kids kind of a little playground um with his family you know a wooden kind of playground and there is these green kind of military tarps laid out and these two bodies of dogmen are lying on these tarps and uh she looks at her brother and he says to her it looks like they had been shot it looks like there was you know a mini war here what the hell georgia what what's going on here why you know and she's like we have to go we have to get out of here right now you know i've got my kids are at my families or our families well i gotta figure out what i'm doing i have nothing she has nothing her whole life is just gone in a two-day period of time and they get back to her family's house and about a day later, as she's still dealing with all this, they're now um, figuring out burial arrangements and all this. Uh, the autopsy was real quick. Wild animal attack. And there's a knock at the door. And it's one of the local police officers uh, accompanied by a very large southern gentleman and they're asked if they can come in and talk to talk to Georgia and oh yeah yeah and what she's told is that they are no, she is no longer allowed to live there. Um, that they, she will be given some money for the property <clears throat> that, you know, uh, we're going to buy the property from you. This isn't the, the police officer. This is this Southern guy who's, you know, she's never seen before. And he's in, you know, uh, these greenish kind of khaki pants, um, boots, military looking boots. And, uh, green kind of shirt t-shirt tucked in with a green kind of button up over that no insignias no badges nothing 
um, we'll give you money for your property down there and we'll make sure that you're in a home and that your kids are taken care of. Um, as long as you, you know, don't mention anything, we've got enough going on in the area with, you know, this family feud that popped off again for some reason. And, um, don't worry about it. You're, you're, you'll be fine. And sure enough, um, she's given some money and she, uh, has her family. She's, you know, a mom, a woman, no, no husband anymore. Her family builds this kind of small, uh, home kind of almost attached to her family, her, her family's home, her mom and dad's home. And, um, so now she's living there and she is told to forget about it. There's just, you know, so much going on. So now throughout the years of this, um, there has been countless disappearances and countless unexplained deaths in Clay County, Kentucky, in that area of Manchester, uh, <clears throat> bright side or bright shade. Um, and still to this day, still to this day, there are disappearances. I think she said last year, there were over six people that disappeared and that there are air quotes murders that she knows damn well weren't murders and she knows damn well what killed these people and these dogmen are running wild through this Appalachia region of Kentucky and her life has you know never never been the same after that terrifying night in August of 91 periodically her I mean her her kids didn't really even get to to know their dad four and two you don't you can't you know, the love is there, but they, these poor kids will never, ever, and they don't, they don't remember their dad, you know, and they're in their forties, early forties now. And she's in her seventies and still lives in that area to this day. And there are still people finding or citing these things still out there in those woods. And that brings us to those people that are disappearing, those air quote murders, this and that. She believes 100% without a shadow of a doubt that these dog men are doing it. And she probably won't, you know, ever feel whole again. And that's when I, I kind of, just to hear the anguish in her heart. But when she described how that thing got off her husband. And then she got, you know, other family members to come back with her. Uh, to see his body and the shape that it was in. I don't even know. It's crazy. It's so sad. It's so friggin' sad that, and this is why I've really fallen in love with people that are in that region 
the Appalachia region. And I've got, you know, and my, my, um, <clears throat> one of my theories is that these things are attracted to that region because of the poverty level and drug addiction level. And Reginald, yes, and Georgia were in, you know, they were, they were not wealthy at all. Um, but it's just crazy. It's freaking crazy. This poor woman. And to hear how she talked about, you know, her husband and her kids and the poor kids never growing up with a dad. It was, it was quite, quite bothersome. I'll tell you that much. This poor woman. Guys, um, you know, and it doesn't fit either because I've always said the Appalachia region, you know, these with poverty, drug addiction, mental illness. And Reginald didn't have a drug addiction. He wasn't mentally ill. I mean, he did have a job. It wasn't, you know, a huge t sum of money back then, but a decent amount. You know, it's just a sad case, a real sad case. And I want to thank you, Georgia, for, for sharing that with me because it was, uh, it was almost like my mom telling me this, you know, you just hear the anguish in her heart. Well, there you go, folks, just in an absolute tragic subscriber submitted experience. Uh, can't even imagine just the anguish. I'd like to thank you all for supporting the channel. It is, after all, your support that keeps the channel growing and going. And honestly, what well, gives people a chance to share their experiences and theories judgment-free, simply treated with the respect that we all deserve. Everyone, please stay safe, happy, healthy, and ever vigilant, keeping an eye on our children, our pets, our family, and friends. These creatures are real. They are out there and dangerous. Share this information with those you love and care about, and it may just help save their lives someday. Until next time, never stop asking questions, never stop searching for the truth, and God bless you all.